oh, do I need to make it a magazine cover for me to tell people I'm bisexual? Like, no, it's not. Who cares? Like, I, it's not that big of a deal to me. From The Advocate Magazine, in partnership with GLAAD, I'm Jeffrey Masters, and this is LGBTQ and A. In doing this podcast, one of the biggest surprises I've seen is how coming out has changed. It means something different than it did five, even ten years ago. And no, this doesn't apply to everyone. It for sure differs depending on where you live in the world. But when I came out, it felt like an earthquake that shifted the ground of my house, something that affected everyone around me. Being queer and pursuing one's dreams, they were seen as mutually exclusive. And now with this younger generation, people like Lily Reinhardt, that is not the case. Lily describes a feeling of nonchalance around her queerness. It is defining, yes, but it's not earth-shattering. It doesn't change her goals or plans for her future in the way that it once might have. And I think that is an amazing example for people to have, queer or not. Lily is 24, best known for her role as Betty Cooper on the TV show Riverdale, and next week she has a book of poetry coming out. Her first, it's called Swimming Lessons. Today we talk about all that on the podcast and more, so let's get to it. Without further ado, here's Lily Reinhardt. If it is okay with you, I'd like to jump right into talking about being queer. Sure, I would love to. Amazing. So in June, you posted, although I've never announced it publicly before, I'm a proud bisexual woman. That was just mm -hmm. a couple of months ago. Why in your life was that the right time to share that with people? You know, I've wanted people to know that I am bisexual, but I've never felt that there was like a right time to do it. I was afraid of coming out, you know, I didn't want people to tell me that I was lying to get attention or something. And so I kind of just kept my mouth shut. I also, I've told people in the past and they've told me, oh, you know, it's a phase. And I'm like, okay, great, thanks. So, you know, that's discouraging, obviously. I think that happens with bisexuality a lot. Because I like men and women, they're more of like, oh, well, it's a phase. You know, you like what you, you're just, you're, it's a phase with women. And I'm like, whatever you say. So take us back, like you write this post and you hit send. What did that moment feel like for you before the reaction started coming in? I think I didn't want people to think that I was making something that really wasn't about me, about me in referring to the the protest that was going on. You know, I, I came out when supporting a, a protest. I kind of tried to do it as nonchalantly as possible. I guess coming out is not a nonchalant thing. It just didn't seem like a big deal to me. And it also kind of like the way I look at the world right now, I'm like, isn't everyone like, that's how I look at it. I'm like, isn't everyone bisexual? Like, is this, uh, you know, so I didn't really feel like this was any breaking news by any means. And so to get kind of the attention that I got was kind of surprising to me. I, I wasn't expecting it. I was like, oh, shit. I'm really fascinated by like the public versus private coming out. So it sounds like this is very much something that you did not just discover about yourself. Yeah. You know, I remember being in fifth grade and thinking to myself, like, I'm thinking about girls a lot. I didn't tell anybody. It was very like a private thing. I was only 10. Like, that's a quite, quite young, in my opinion. So that was an interesting revelation for me. And, and then my idea of sexuality kind of, it didn't really come up again until I like moved to LA when I was 18 and um, started to have feelings for this girl when I was here and like being sexually attracted to her. And I really kind of identified as straight. I didn't really think about it other than that until I was put in a position where I found myself like really attracted to this one girl that I was hanging out with. And then I guess just over the course of the last couple of years, like I've, I've realized that it's just part of me and I didn't really stop to even th think about it until a couple of years ago again. I don't know. It was, it was just, it was just an interesting self-exploration. 
I think I was so interested in how you came out also because you've been on magazine covers and you very like easily could have had another cover to announce your queerness. And I think it shows like what progress we've made as a society where like if a celebrity had to come out, it had to be on the cover. And now it's so nonchalant. And I just love that message that sends to other queer kids. They're like, hey, this is not like the biggest deal ever. Yeah. And it shouldn't be like, I didn't, I did not want that for, for me. Like, oh, do I need to make it a magazine cover for me to tell people I'm bisexual? Like, no, it's not, who cares? Like I, it's not that big of a deal to me. Like it's not something that it's not like our sexuality defines who we are, but I think a lot of times people want it to they want our sexuality to be the defining oh that gay guy or that lesbian you know like that's that's what people love to do and love to say and it's like I would hope that being out and owning your sexuality isn't something that needs to have press around it So even though your queerness is not that big of a deal to you, we still live in a world where it is a big deal? Correct. I mean, were you afraid that you were going to be like, quote unquote, outed to like the world before you were ready? Not necessarily. I think my biggest fear, to be honest, was people telling me that I was coming out for attention. That was my biggest fear. And I'm not necessarily sure why, but I think it to me in my eyes, it kind of became like a fad, like that people like, you know, oh, we're coming out. People were bisexual. People were dating women. Like, and it was coming out kind of rubbed me the wrong way because I I, believe it or not. And I know I get myself in a lot of hot water sometimes by speaking up and being vocal about things, but I do not like to be the center of attention. And it's ironic because I am like a pretty open book. So I'm like, I'm constantly balancing that. Like, but I, but I also don't think that sexuality is something that needs to be, it's just not something that needs to be super private, I guess. And, and, you know, one of my friends was saying, why did you feel the need to do that? Like he, he wasn't, judging me for it he was just saying why did why did you need to do that just why did you feel like you needed to tell the world and I was like I don't have like a very philosophical beautiful answer for that I just think why not it's not a secret it's not something that I was ever ashamed of and I felt like in that moment I wanted to show my full support for this community and the fact that I belong to it. It was very like freeing in that sense. It felt very much like, yeah, I'm here. I've been here the whole time. I am part of this. And you know, with Riverdale, you were thrown into the spotlight very young and almost overnight. Did any producers or older actors sit you down and say, hey, this thing is blowing up and fame can be really, really weird. Here are some things to be mindful of or to be wary of, etc. I remember during season one, Machen Amick, who plays my mom on the show, she and I are very close. She's my second mom. I love her so dearly. We were in like the little cast area, me and Camila. And she started talking to us because she was on Twin Peaks. She was in an environment with other young women. And she was like, throughout this, you guys are going to be pinned against each other sometimes. Like people are going to compare your careers. People are going to compare your social media followings. Sometimes one of you is going to be ahead and sometimes one of you is going to be behind. But it's always going to be in flux and you can't hold that against each other. You can't become in competition with one another when people are going to naturally try to compare the two of you. And it's true, you know, like, I I, I think we're lucky. No one really sits there and compares. It's not like a Betty and Veronica feud, like, oh, Lily and Camila, like what, you know, it's, it's not like that at all. But it is, it was really good advice. And I think also Luke was, was one to bestow a lot of wisdom upon us. I think when we were filming the pilot, actually, we all were sitting down having a drink and I was like 19. <laughs> so I was like, oh my God, I'm having drinks with like these cool people. It's, it's sad that I really don't even remember exactly what he said, but I think it was something like, okay, you guys are young. You're on this show, like enjoy every second of it. Take it in, but also be kind. Be, and he, he always really promoted like being so kind to everyone that you worked with, being kind to the crew, being kind to people behind the scenes. Everyone loved Luke for a reason. 
This is Luke Perry, who most people know from Beverly Hills 90210. Yeah, Luke Perry, because he was so, he was just so kind to everyone. Like he knew, he just greeted people by, he looked at your face when he said hello to you and like made sure that when he was talking to you, you felt like, wow, he genuinely cares. Luke was an anomaly, I think. That's really nice. And with this new book of poems that you just released, I don't want to read every poem and take it as literal autobiography. Correct. But I feel like you put out a book like this and you have to accept that people are going to read it and assume that like every line is about your ex-boyfriend, right? Correct. And that's something that is kind of horrifying (laughs) to an extent, but I also am kind of just like... I can't control, I can't control everything. Like I genuinely just really wanted to share my poetry with the world. And believe it or not, a lot of the poems are not about my ex-boyfriend. It's about just like the human experience. I almost wanted to publish it anonymously because I don't want people to do that. But, you know, inherently people are going to, and I can't change that. I, I like to look at my poems as, as not, autobiographical. I like to look at them as the little stories, little scenes that I've created in order to express a certain emotion. That's what I would like people to go into this with, not being like, oh, let me try and read between the lines and put the pieces together and be like, oh, this is what happened in her world. Because that's, you're not going to find out anything like the, like that. That's just not the case. Well, I also think that the emotion you're evoking almost across the board is a romantic one. And I have an example. You wrote, My future is beautiful because I see the happiness that is inevitable for me with you by my side. I mean, does that track for you? Are you a very romantic person? Oh my god, I am the most romantic person. I have a tattoo of a rose on my arm that I got to basically represent to myself and to remind myself that I am, and this is how I like to phrase it, I am a warrior for love is how I like to say it. I know it's cheesy, but because I always choose love every time. Love, I have the power of unconditional love. I am able to love people unconditionally. And um, I'm very proud of that. And I'm proud that I wear my heart on my sleeve not just on my sleeve, but my heart is kind of outside my body most of the time. You know, it's like I'm a very vulnerable, very giving, loving human being. And and that's something that over the last however many years I've I've quietly and slowly learned to really embrace and be proud of. And so, yeah, when, yes, I publish a book of poetry, I think I am quite a romantic, very much a romantic, very, very much Probably too much. (laughs) I also bring that up because your ex-boyfriend is your Riverdale co-star, Cole Sprouse. And I think you have the one job in the world where you might have to make out with your ex-boyfriend for your job. (laughs) Do you have a sense of humor about that or is it still too fresh? Um, I can have a sense of humor about it. I think it's, it's really kind of like... 0.0000001% of human beings ever have to do that. And it's not, I'm not going to lie to you, it's not an easy thing to do. It's not something that you want to do when you're trying to, I don't know, move on. But, you know, I think I have a good outlook on it. I know it's my job and I'm doing my job. You know, I'm just doing my job. Well, I think that goes to one aspect of bisexuality that I find so compelling. You know, while you are a part of the queer community, you are not always going to be dating people in the queer community. Correct. Has that created issues for you in the past? I think that's why I didn't come out as bisexual until I was not in a relationship anymore. Um, Because, again, yeah, it's easy for people to question, you know, like, oh, but you're with a man that's straight. Um, It's like, yeah, well, Anna Paquin is married to a man, but she is bisexual because she's been with women and she likes women. So it's kind of like, I think people are always going to have something to say, but you know, yeah, people are just always going to have some shit to say. And that's fine. Like I've accepted that, but I guess I didn't really feel, it felt like maybe a little bit of a, 
I didn't want to put my ex in a position that seems like it would have been a little strange to come out when I was in a hetero relationship. It just seemed kind of, I don't know, maybe a little bit like I was looking for something else while I was in the relationship. So I didn't really think about coming out until after I was not in a relationship anymore. Just It just felt more organic that way. And a couple of times in talking to you, you've mentioned that like people don't believe that bisexuality is a thing. Is that something that you had to get over for yourself? Yeah, it is. I think I had to truly, like, I had to, I didn't think about the fact that I was bisexual for like eight years after first realizing that I was attracted to women. Like I was 10 when I realized. And then like, I didn't really think about it until I was 18 because I was, you know, dating guys. I was in high school, like never, we had like one out girl in our school, one lesbian girl. And she was known as the lesbian. And that was like awful, you know, like, why would you do that? Why would you brand someone that way? Just because of their, like, do you know how many people were secretly gay in my high school? Probably a lot. I mean, a lot of bisexual people do, but of course we didn't know about it because no one talked about it. Of course not. (laughs) Okay, tell me this, big question. When you did come out publicly, did you have any ladies sliding into your DMs? I did have a couple of ladies sliding into my DMs, which I thought was funny, but like also flattering. <laughs> yeah, I was like, it was interesting to see the uh, the difference in my DMs after I came out, which was which was a nice little surprise. It was just nice. Yeah, I guess. It was Wait, nice. difference in gender, but are you also saying difference in approaches? Difference in genders for sure, and also just like I hate to say it, like more quality human beings like people who genuinely like are coming to because they're saying like oh like you know thank you for doing that or you're very you know I really appreciate you you doing that rather than like you know some random person saying like hey wanna fuck (laughs) you know like it, it just was more I hate to say it but like just more quality messages like people genuinely who care Yeah. Another thing I've seen you be very open about is your mental health and coping with anxiety. Can I ask what that anxiety looks like for you and how it manifests? A lot of different ways. I I get stressed out very easily. It does not take a lot to make me stressed out. For example, I have a lot of emails currently in my inbox waiting for me to respond to them. And I'm can't like, I'm like, I can't do it. I can't, I can't look at them. Like it's very much avoid, avoid my phone. My phone gives me anxiety. I hate talking on the phone. Like I really hate phone calls. How often does it affect your job when you're on set? You know, it definitely does. It definitely does. Sometimes when I'm, I'm in, I can definitely be in my own little world, you know, like, oh, I have this to deal with. I'm dealing with this. Like, oh, this article came out. It's pissing me off. And then I have to go play Betty Cooper. Like it's not an easy transition. A lot of the time and how could it be you know like it's it's very I'm dealing with my own life and then I have to go like portray a certain emotion on screen it can be really hard I think I the past couple months I've tried to really practice meditation and I am 100% a crystal loving bitch like I have crystals everywhere I very much believe in the power of crystals I'm also training to be a Reiki healer at the moment. That is very cool. Yeah, that's something that I've wanted to do for a couple of years now. So I'm starting to take lessons to become a Reiki master. That's going to be amazing. You know, I was asking about your anxiety because when I see you on camera, you have this amazing natural ease on camera. Mm. But do you yourself see your anxiety as affecting your performance ever? No. I don't let it affect my performances. Sometimes it can be really hard to shut off my world and fully dive into someone else's world. But like my work and acting is so important to me that I, I snap out of it. Like I just, I'm just like, I have a job to do and that's, and I get it done. So with these mental health struggles you have, you've talked about how pre-Riverdale you were pursuing acting and dealing with rejection and figuring out how to manage that. And then suddenly you're cast in Riverdale and you have a massive spotlight shining on you. Yeah. You're famous. 
And that has an effect on your mental health in a completely new way. Even though the source or the cause of that anxiety is so different, does it feel the same in your brain when you're in the middle of it? I would say that it does. It definitely does. Like it's still, rejection still hurts, you know? Like when I don't get a role that I really am seeking and I, and it doesn't work out, maybe it doesn't feel as hopeless as it did before Riverdale because, you know, each audition that I had before Riverdale was, I need to make money. Now it's a little bit more like, you know, I don't need it to survive, but I need it to, you know, I don't need it in general, but I want it to fulfill my soul. Basically acting is really such a soul fulfilling thing for me. It just really is. So it's the only job that doesn't give me anxiety. So it's very important. Uh, And so I think that my anxiety towards fame and it's a little bit more like I can step back more easily and be like, these are champagne problems that I'm having right now. Like having a lot of emails, that's a champagne problem. Like that's, I'm fine. Like I'm going to be all right. I need to stop bitching about it. And at 15 or 16, had someone told you that you would book a role this big, that 25 million people would follow you on Instagram, and that you'd be supporting yourself with just acting, what would your reaction have been? I think I think I would have been like, hell yeah. Because I, I would have been like, I worked so hard and tirelessly from when I was 16. Well... I started acting when I was like 12, but like, did I think I would ever be in the position that I'm in now at 23? No. And so that's something that I don't take for granted. Like the fact that I can support myself as an actress, I wouldn't have thought that, you know, at 15. But if you would have said, hey, you're going to book a role on a CW show and it's going to be really successful and you're going to be a working actress, I would have been like... Yes, that makes sense because it means that like all my hard work and my drive and my ambition paid off. And I think that that is an amazing place to leave it at. So thank you so much for doing this. Of course. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And big thank you to Lily for that. Her new book of poetry comes out next week and it is called Swimming Lessons. Now, if you enjoyed the interview, amazing. Thank you. But we have a favor to ask. Please make sure that you are subscribed to the podcast and leave a comment on Apple Podcasts. It is a huge help to our show, just like spreading the word on social media. So thank you so much to everyone who does that. We're on Twitter at LGBTQ Pod. I'm on there at Jeff Masters One. Those are both great ways to recommend guests. We are an LGBTQ interview series, though, so please keep that in mind. I'm laughing because it seems like every week we get suggestions that are amazing, but are of straight people. So you can just, like, forward those on to Joe Rogan or anyone else. And if that was you, no worries at all. Are you spiraling? Maybe. Am I spiraling? Definitely. Do I judge that? No. It is a global pandemic, so everybody can just relax. Okay, we're brought to you by The Advocate Magazine in partnership with GLAAD. Both brands are celebrating bi-week right now. That's B-I-week. So come check out our websites at advocate.com and glad.org. I'm Jeffrey Masters, and I will see you next week. Goodbye.